Hi friends, thank you for tuning in to our Friday Facebook Live session, take two. Take two. Take two. Um, my name is Dr. Mary Sunderland and I'm the Director of Research and Education here at the Foundation Fighting Blindness in Canada. Today I am joined by my colleague, Dr. Chad Andrews. We work together closely in the Research and Education Department here at the FFB. So today we're going to be focusing on a story that we circulated recently over e-news called Gene Therapy Improves Vision in Landmark Clinical Trial. It's a really important story. It's been making a lot of headway in the news, generating, generating a lot of discussion in the uh, vision science community. So that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. And we've also had a lot of calls come in. We've had a lot of questions coming in through our Facebook site. And today it's really about answering those questions because we wanna make sure that, you know, part of answering the questions and having the dialogue is a really important way to, to continue to move the research forward. So before we get to that Q&A, answering the questions that you've been sending in, I'm going to give you a top level, everything you need to know about why is this story exciting, what does it mean for the future of gene therapy here in Canada and around the world? So again, as Chad mentioned, the title of the story, if you want to look it up on our website, is Gene Therapy Improves Vision in Landmark Clinical, Tri in Landmark Clinical Trial. So what is so landmark about this trial? Well, this trial is the first ever uh, phase three randomized controlled clinical trial testing and experimental gene therapy. And this particular trial is focused on a gene therapy for the disease Leber's congenital amaurosis, LCA. This is a rare blinding eye disease. It's sort of a form of retinitis pigmentosa that affects very young children where often children are, are born with very little vision and lose their vision um, uh, com completely while they're still kids. So it's, it's quite a... Uh, it's one of, one of the rare forms of RP that really progresses quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and this is research that has been in the works for a very long time. We've been talking about gene therapy for, for decades, really. It started off just as an idea. We were talking about gene therapy in our last Facebook Live session. We know there are lots of people working on this piece. But with this being the very first trial that's moved it all the way into the phase three category and what people are studying at phase three in this once you get to phase three uh, what you're asking is does this work is this effective in the earlier phases phase one phase one two phase two you're you are really focused on safety granted you're focused on safety all the way through but phase three it's about does this work or not what's really exciting about this paper looks like it works. I mean, they've got evidence that it works. And not just any kind of evidence, this is like the gold standard of evidence. If you can set up this phase three randomized, randomized means some people got the treatment, others got a placebo, like a sugar pill, and then you can compare. You, com you compare the people that got it with the people that didn't get it, and you can see, is this having an effect? And something really cool, I think it really describes the effect of this paper, um, and it's something that's I think a little bit easier to imagine. Uh, it was This is something that I saw at a recent ophthalmology conference just this June. Very, very striking results. I've talked with Chad about it before, and I wrote about it in the story, that the way that they measure does this work or not, is they use a functional test of vision. So they had patients, participants who were enrolled in the trial, go through a maze test where there's like a maze on the floor. You can imagine, um, you know, kind of like a size of a twister. People know what twister is? I think people Chess. still may know what twister is. Twister? Let's go. Okay. So <laughs> Not in a long time. <laughs> and on this map, they've got large arrows kind of directing which way to turn, some obstacles to step over. And before receiving um, this gene therapy uh, injection, in the eye, uh, the participants are kind of walking off the mat, right. signifying that they can't they can't see the mat very well. Mm -hmm. And then after having the treatment, you can see them following the arrows, walking through the maze, stepping over obstacles. It was a really it was kind of an awe-inspiring moment at the conference actually to be surrounded by ophthalmologists who were sort of waiting to be able to, when can I get this? Yeah. When can I offer this as a treatment? And so it's important to know that when something is still at the clinical trial phase, um, doctors actually can't offer it as a treatment. 
because it's still an experiment. We're still trying to learn, does this work or not? And what was so landmark and exciting about this trial is that, well, now we have gold standard evidence that it seems to work. And so the, um, the company that's sponsoring this trial is named Spark Therapeutics, and so they're in discussions with the FDA to try and figure out um, how can we make this into a treatment? How can we make this available to the people who need it that would allow doctors to actually sort of prescribe it to a patient? So if they see a patient coming in, it looks like they have LCA, Leber's congenital amaurosis, uh, and more than that, LCA with mutations in the RPE65 gene. Well, you know what, we have something for you. And we've been working here at the foundation since 1974 because so many people, when they get that diagnosis, there's nothing that doctors can really offer to them, right? right? So yeah. it's, this, is a, this is pretty huge. Yeah, I think the, the functional vision part of it that mm -hmm. you were mentioning that you spoke about, that you wrote about in the story, uh, is really impressive too because that's what matters when it comes to eyesight, mm -hmm. right? Like every day when we get up, we don't read an eye chart, which yeah. is the kind of go-to test for visual acuity, but we do navigate our surroundings and the world around us. And that's mm -hmm. what you saw in that video was uh, this kind of stark difference between you know the inability to navigate that maze and then after the, the intervention, the ability to actually do so quite successfully. I think that's really incredible and it's something to be excited about. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we're certainly excited about it. Yeah, you can yeah. tell <laughs> just by looking at us, I'm sure. Um, so with that, I mean, if you have, if you want to learn more about the details, I encourage you to go and, and read the full story on our site. Uh, but with that, we really want to get to your questions right away because we know that's why you're tuning in. So Chad, let's get started on those questions. Let's do that. Absolutely. So many of our Facebook followers commented um, about the, the relationship between the progression or stage of the retinal disease. Um, and uh, one's eligibility for a clinical trial. So I guess the question is, how does my the progression of my form of retinitis pigmentosa or some other uh, retinal eye disease uh, affect my ability to actually be involved in the clinical trial? And the answer to that is really that there is no general answer. There is no universally applicable rule that we can give you to say that this is how you know the stage of my disease is going to impact my involvement in clinical trials going forward. And that's because clinical trials are quite unique, and you really have to gauge them on a trial by trial basis. So the thing that we keep on kind of hitting on, I think we talked about this during the last session a little bit, is that you really want to look at the clinical trials that are relevant to you, so for your particular um, uh, uh, genetic eye disease, and uh, look at the eligibility criteria. And sometimes those criteria specify age, sometimes they specify the particular gene, that's involved in your disease. Sometimes they specify the progression of the eye disease. Um, and so that's what you want to, to pay attention to. So sometimes the, the stage of the disease is going to be quite important, sometimes it's not going to matter. It really depends on the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good way to think about it, Chad, is that often we want to be able to give general answers because it's great if one answer can work for everybody. Um, but in this case, you really do have to do the work to figure out What's this, what is uh, exactly relevant to you? And you need to kind of dig into those details. And we know that digging into the details is tough, especially something else I wanted to make sure I flagged during this discussion. Um, there was actually a big paper that came out this week that again has been all over, over the news. And it's a paper that publicizes the fact that clinicaltrials.gov, this website that is really heavily used by people who are affected by, by diseases, is full of bunk like just bad trials that are uh, not the thing that you want to get involved with at all. So we really see that this is a really important role that we want to help help you with to help you figure out what are the trials that you might be eligible for and what are the trials that are worth your time and that they're well designed, they're safety, they meet just those basic safety and regulatory checks. Um, and that kind of moves into the next question, which is sort of it's sort of in line with the eligibility criteria. Um, this is a question that came in from Wilco about uh, what age is someone usually avail um, able to participate in a clinical trial? And again, we can't give a general answer because it really depends on the specific eligibility criteria that are associated with each individual trial. And in fact, one particular trial, um, and this is, this is often the case with gene therapies, one trial might have many different 
arms of one trial. So you might have, this is true, I believe, of the, um, was certainly true of this uh, LCA trial uh, at the earlier stages. You know, you have one site that's testing on, you know, children aged, you know, six and above, one site that's focused more on adults. You know, you can have uh, these very carefully designed trials that try to figure out, does this work better for people who are 18 and older and maybe have a disease that's you know further along and or does it work better for kids who still have perhaps more functional vision left uh, so there are actually many many trials that are that are open to children but what's different when you're if you have a child and you might be interested in your child participating in a trial is that children are not able to consent on their own so as a parent, you, you take on that responsibility and you have to think about consenting for your child and about the risks, the benefits uh, for your child in the short term and the long term. <clears throat> and this is something that it's really challenging. I mean, it's, it's a tough thing to do. And we've actually been involved with um, a research team out, out of the University of Alberta who's been really trying to think about um, how can we improve the way that we communicate about clinical trials um, with parents who might be considering enrolling their, their children in a trial because we know it's not an easy decision to make. So uh, there are absolutely opportunities for children to be involved in the trials, including some of the trials we talked about uh, during our last session. Um, and we encourage you, if this is something that you'd be willing to talk more with us about and some of the things that you're thinking through, um, please reach out to us and we can connect you with more resources. Yeah, that's a theme that we keep coming back to mm -hmm. is that uh, our role, at least as it stands right now, is to help you navigate the landscape of clinical trials uh, when it comes to the clinical trials that are relevant to you, as opposed to just giving you a list of rules that you have to follow that are generally applicable. Um, like we keep on saying, you want to look at the the individual trial and the criteria associated with that trial. Um, that brings us to the next question, uh, which is really a set of questions because we were receiving these from a number of you, uh, including Amy and Kyle. Uh, these are questions such as, how can I participate in a clinical trial? Is it a first come first serve basis? Uh, how do researchers determine who can participate? So questions involving how do I get involved? Um, uh, what does that involvement look like? Do I have to get in early so that I can be at the start of the line? And um, there are a number of ways that we can kind of tackle this. So I'll, I'll just kind of start off by reiterating my last point, which is uh, that uh, one of the things you can do to prepare yourself for an upcoming clinical trial or just kind of get in tune with the landscape and all the available trials that uh, may be important for you is to just reach out to us. Uh, like I said, this is the role that we're hoping to fill as we ourselves become better acquainted with clinical trials. Um, so by all means, you can reach out directly to us and we can have a conversation about, about the trials and your particular genetic history or disease and we can kind of figure out um, uh, the best way to kind of think through all the available trials. Mm -hmm. And then I will build on that. Um, and this is something that we'll, we'll keep reminding people about and it's a, it's a really important advocacy cause for us right now and this is a genetic testing. So right now we're talking about a, as I said, a, a rare form of RP. It's called Leber's congenital amaurosis, LCA. And uh, you can know if you have this disease. Your doctor can, you know, can give a pretty, pretty good diagnosis based on different tests that they might do for you. But what really confirms it is what gets called a genetic diagnosis, a molecular diagnosis. This is a genetic testing piece. So something that you can do if you are um, living with an, an inherited retinal dystrophy or an inherited retinal disease, uh, some you know this counts Stargardt's retinitis pigmentosa, choroideremia. There's a whole list of um, sort of the main inherited eye diseases on the FFB website. If you've been given a diagnosis of any of these uh, diseases, you can do something today, next week and it's you can get your genetic testing done. And I just actually had an incredible call with one of the clinicians who we work with just earlier this week, and he's saying that just this year, he's going back in, he's encouraging his patients to go back and get their genetic testing done. And with, with patients that had not been able to get a successful result before, almost 70% of them 
are getting results now That's because great. there are so many more genes that we can test for that we just didn't know about before. So this is the importance of the research. We're continuing to find research because we're still finding new genes and these genes are leading to new tests that can be done. And those tests, when people can get a confirmed diagnosis, this is sort of the genetic cause underlying my disease. Uh, it gives so many more insights into what opportunities might be available to you moving forward, but also from um, speaking with various um, patients who have worked really hard to get this done. It's just a bit of a like, okay, now I, now I know. You know a little bit more and knowledge is power. Absolutely, yeah. So it's not about mm -hmm. just getting into existing clinical trials, yeah. it's about preparing for the clinical trials that are coming down the pipe. And we know that this is, um, I keep on thinking about it as a kind of boom period, especially mm -hmm. in the world of uh, clinical trials for gene therapy. Uh, so really, that's incredibly important. You want to know your genetic history, not just so that existing trials, but so that you can prepare yourself for the upcoming waves of trials that are coming down mm -hmm. the pipe. Mm -hmm. And so the only way to really know is with this specific, you know, potential treatment work for you, we wouldn't be able to your genetic testing done. That's the first thing that you need to do. Right. And then back to the advocacy piece, which is something that, that we work on here at the Foundation Fighting Blindness, because we know that genetic testing is not equally accessible to different people who are living in Canada and certainly not accessible around the world. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're certainly going to focus on the inequities that exist uh, across Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chad is actually on his way out to Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, this weekend he'll be in St. John's um, talking with Dr. Jane Green, who's a leader um, in genetics of, of ocular diseases. And she's been working really hard to think, how can we make genetic testing available, accessible to the people living in the Maritimes, people living um, in St. John's, yeah, in yeah. Newfoundland and Labrador. So we, uh, if you're having trouble getting your genetic testing done, reach out to us, let us know, because you should be able to get it. Mm -hmm. You should be able to. Yeah, and we'll continue working with individuals such as Dr. Jane Green, who've been uh, working in the field for a long time, mm -hmm. trying to answer that very question, mm -hmm. right? Uh, not just studying the individual biology of uh, a particular disease or how it affects a particular organism, but looking at broader populations mm -hmm. and trying to understand how genetic diseases uh, uh, impact families and then cross mm -hmm. between and among families as well. Um, so uh, Dr. Green is an incredible example of someone who's trying to think through the problem of how can I prepare how can my family prepare uh, for uh, uh, clinical trials? And the answer is by having a really clear understanding of your genetic history. And I will add to just another component of that question that was brought forward by Amy and Kyle is, how do researchers determine who can participate? And I wanna just make sure we address that question because it reminds everybody that uh, clinical trials are a form of research and that that's a very expensive kind of research and you're working with humans, you're working with, with people who are living with these diseases, so you wanna design that trial to the absolute best of your ability. You wanna minimize the risk as much as you can. You wanna, you wanna make sure that if there's any chance of benefit, you want to design the trial so that people who have the best chance to benefit can actually benefit. And so this is, you know, how do researchers design a trial? They design it like that, they design Okay, what is this thing that I'm testing? What is this gene therapy? How does it work? Okay, who is most likely going to experience some kind of benefit? Right. And that's where the patient registry comes in, where, uh, again, please get involved with the patient registry, the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Patient registry, you can find out about it. We'll make sure there's a link in the comments. You can find out about it on our website. It's that we uh, are working with people who are running the trials so that they can look through our registry and find out, okay, this, this person and where their vision loss is and their genetic diagnosis, this is someone that, that we hope might consider volunteering their time to be in, in our trial because they want to set it up for success. Absolutely. Because it's only when you see success in phase one that you move to phase two. It's only when you see success in phase two that you move to phase three. And the story, this is about success, this is the first ever success in phase three. And then, you know, because this is a rare disease where there, there's no other standard of treatment, 
we get to skip phase four. Phase four is about comparing this a new innovative drug with the standard of care. So skip right to the, the, the regulatory piece, how can we make it a treatment? So if you don't select, if you don't design this well, and you don't select you know, participants that are most likely going to benefit, you're never going to make it through those early phases. So this is very careful scientific experiment. Right, yeah, they've mm -hmm. seen a lot of success just to be able to get to this stage. Yeah. Uh, before we move on, we, we've got one more question that we've kind of uh, are prepared to answer, but something has just come through mm -hmm. from Justina, who is asking, can patients in the US participate in trials in Canada, mm -hmm. and vice versa? You're probably the best person to answer that question. Sure, I mean, this is a great question, Justina, and again, we keep saying it, it always depends on the trial, always depends on the specific trial. Um, but something that is good to know, and that we're really happy about, certainly living in Canada, because uh, there are a lot of trials in the United States. There are, there are fewer of them in Canada right now. We're working to try and bring more to Canada. Um, it is uh, often the people who are designing trials will design it so that they, they build in a little bit of extra budget so that they can uh, help support Canadians to go down and participate in a trial in the U.S and vice versa because again you want to pick the best person for the trial and when the when the fda the food and drug administration is deciding is this something that we are have good enough data to approve and say yeah you know what this is good uh, and they're they're looking at different uh, patients that have participated and the effects on the patients uh, any patient living in north america whether that's in canada or the united states get get judged equally right. by the FDA. So that means that you know, we're, we're encouraging and trying to encourage investigators who are designing clinical trials to consider uh, making sure that, that, that Canadians have a path into the trial and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, I mean, you also mentioned um, the idea of, of uh, us trying to bring more clinical trials to Canada. Mm -hmm. I think that's worth emphasizing. That's something that we're working on, especially mm -hmm. you, Mary, is this issue of you know, how can we prepare ourselves as a community and as a nation to bring more trials, excuse me, more trials into the country so that you can actually access them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be a big part of our work moving forward. Absolutely. Uh, and so let's move on to the next question, which was brought to us <coughs> by, by Venetia, who was asking, you know, you know, what other genetic diseases uh, might be, have access to a trial in the future. What does this mean for, you know, I don't have an RP65 mutation LCA, what about, what does this mean for me? And I think that's an important question and I'm sure it's a question that's shared by many, many people who are tuning in today. Uh, and it's that this, this is a landmark because it's the first, right? You, and you have to start somewhere. And we started with RP65 a while ago and many, many different people have been working on it m at many different phases, right in the lab, figuring out, identifying that gene, testing it in you know, various animal models. You know, we've been working uh, on this problem for a while, and this landmark sort of brings us to a new place. And it is setting the stage for many, many more trials to come and many more genetic diagnoses to come. And so people, who have been waiting for this new this new era of gene therapy are really you know they're they're encouraged by this data that's coming forward, but we still have work to do when we think about you know how can we get this if this really works and it's safe and it works how can we get it to the patients and then how can we address the next patient that is living without any option no treatment option so it's just. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, but uh, you know the best way to ensure that um, clinicians and scientists are thinking about the genetic eye disease that you might be living with. This is another push for the patient registry. This idea of just standing up um, and getting counted because you want to know uh, when people are considering, well, what what genetic disease are we going to look at next? You want to see, well, who has this disease? Mm -hmm. Who who, not only who has this disease, who might be interested in helping to develop a new, a new treatment because these treatments can't be developed without your help. 
So it's, you know, when, for example, with the patient registry here in Canada, when you consent to be enrolled on the registry, you, you say, uh, if there is a trial, then you can contact me and let me know about it because you're sort of thinking, you know what? You're not consenting for sure I want to be in a trial, but you're saying I'm, I'm interested and I, you know, I understand that my involvement could be helpful moving forward. So there are certainly be another question um, from Justina actually about SEP290, which is another um, one of the lead uh, genes that's involved with LCA. There's a lot of work happening with SEP290 right now. So I can follow up with some direct messages to Justina and share more details about the work happening with SEP290. There's some exciting work here in, here in Canada and abroad in Europe. So there is stuff happening um, around the world. Yeah. And it's certainly a lot I mean, to do. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and I think that our, our hope and what we're fighting for is that one day we'll be able to look back at the RPE 65 trials and say, look, that was the catalyst, that was the starting point mm -hmm. for a, a full spectrum of interventions or hopefully even treatments that address a wide range of genetic eye disorders. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's uh, quite possibly the moment that we're, we're at right now and that's the future that we're moving towards. Mm -hmm. And the other piece that I think is important to remember for all of the incredible supporters that we've had along the way, people who have made donations to us and have supported our efforts to, to fund vision research, to fund sight-saving sight research. Uh, this is the one that's made it this far, but there were many different trials that were designed slightly differently, and some of those trials didn't work out. So not every experiment ends with the results you hope it will end with. In fact, most of them don't. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't, and what you get at the end is incredibly valuable knowledge. And and that's the beauty of the scientific process is that you end up with knowledge that you can trust, with information that you can use, that you can bring forward to inform the design in the next step. So it's that careful design, the scientific process. At the very least, you're gonna get some, you know, some great new knowledge that's gonna inform how you can move forward. And so here we are, moving forward together. It's very exciting, incredibly exciting. Um, I think we have moved through most of the questions. I hope we've been able to answer the ones that, you know, we had a lot of questions coming in. We tried to sort of gather them together and answer them in groups that we hope that we've been able to pr provide you with answers. Um, the, the three take home messages that I think are, you know, we, kind of relevant to all the questions that came in about what can you do now? Well, if you have LCA and you have one of these RP65 mutations, certainly reach out to us, especially if you're living in Canada, because we're working hard. We need to start working now if we want to make sure that this, this treatment can be accessible here in Canada. Next, sign up, follow the links um, online, and learn more about our patient registry, the Foundation Fighting Blindness Patient Registry, and how you can um, raise awareness about uh, people who are living with blind and eye diseases um, here in Canada. Mm -hmm. And the last piece is, you know, we know it's not easy, Add it to your list of things to do, get genetic testing done. Because this is this is something you can do, uh, you know, not today, but you can have it something that, you know, you can take action on. Absolutely. Taking yeah. actions, it's empowering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mary has flagged this already, uh, but we'll just mention it again. There are unfortunately barriers to access when it comes to, access to, to uh, getting your genetic testing done, uh, especially in uh, rural communities. So that's something that you can talk to us about mm -hmm. as well. If you're having difficulty finding a genetic counselor, getting your genetic testing done, uh, there are things that we can do to help you with that. And in fact, we've already posted an everything you need to know style guide to genetic testing. It was recently updated. Uh, please take a look at that. And uh, if you haven't already, sign up for our e-news. Uh, like I had flagged earlier, uh, the e-news is the sort of main way that we reach out to you with monthly updates, the, kind of the monthly update. Uh, that we often connect the Facebook Live sessions to, uh, but it's also the kind of primary vehicle that we uh, utilize for delivering breakthrough um, uh, news in the world of vision science, and this is an example of a breakthrough piece that we just felt like we had to let you know about and we had to talk mm -hmm. about it. It's that important. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is, it's, it was really neat to have, you know we had our story up there and we were answering people's 
questions and then to see more and more stories in the news about it and know that you know we have got it up there it's a trusted source and we want to make sure that you can hear about it first because we know that you know nothing can come fast enough and we understand that urgency so uh, please do consider signing up for our e-news and keep sending in your questions. I really enjoy getting to know you during these sessions and we hope that if you are able to attend one of our in-person education sessions this fall that you'll consider signing up for one of those. Again, you can find more information on our website under the Learn tab. And uh, Dr. Andrews is on his way to St. John's in Newfoundland and Labrador tomorrow where he's going to be meeting with Dr. Jane Green and our colleague, the fantastic April Watts, who will be launching our first ever Cycle for Sight, St. John's, Chad. That's it. We've got the Cycle for Sight hat. You've come very prepared. And uh, I'm thrilled. I wish I could be out there because the people who are leading this, um, Lawrence and Amy, Lawrence lives, lives with RP. He's such a fantastic force of positive energy out there and I wish I could be out there cycling. So maybe Chad, you're gonna need this. I appreciate that. but. <laughs> I've heard that it's bug season in Newfoundland, so I've come prepared. Mary, I know that you like me to be branded whenever I go out, but I've actually brought my own hat that I'll be using. It's quite complicated, so open it up. But I'll be going to Newfoundland. I'm going to wear this on the plane, actually, as well, uh, just because I'm not prepared. But uh, I appreciate your offer. <laughs> but this is how I'll be traveling. And if you see me in Newfoundland, just look for the guy in the uh, meshed cap, and we'll have a conversation about okay. it. <laughs> it's been great chatting with all of you thank you for sending in your questions <laughs> we'll see you next time see you next time bye